thanks everyone for joining. So this is our last webinar for 2023, which is almost rounding off the fourth year of us doing this. We started in March of 2020. So we've done 2021, 22, and now 23. And um, it's just been a wonderful experience of firstly building this community of people of a like mind, of like values that care about getting the best out of themselves and helping others do the same. But secondly, the amount that we've learned about ID and how to apply it, me too. I feel like I've learned more than anybody else around some of the nuances. This forum has just been wonderful. So to all of you who have been um, regular attenders and contributors this year, thank you very much. To those of you who are new, welcome. You're about to experience, I think, a really powerful uh, process and community that as you get into 2024, I hope you find like we do, that it's just a really wonderful way to energize your day and frankly your month you know so and and stay in stride um with a with a great group of people um so we'll reconvene i think our first webinar ian for 2024 is early february i think it's yes it is i think yeah. it's the 7th of february 7th or 8th of february which will be us um australia a, yeah a good break um through january to allow everyone to have some rest and look forward to our topic for 2024 when I did some research on what are the hot topics of 2024 coming up, collaborative leadership is one of them. And, and I remember my reaction when I read that. I'm like, oh, yes, about time this really bubbled its way to the top because collaboration has been a topic that leaders have banged on about for years. You know, that we, we, we need more collaboration. We need to be more cross-functional. We've got to get rid of our silos. And another year is just about to finish. And if you look back and said, and how much progress have we made? Most teams, most companies culturally would say it's still an issue. And frankly, they're getting really frustrated with it because they've invested a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of process in trying to drive better collaboration. And yet, like we found with change, when people say with change efforts, 80% of them fail. I say when it comes to collaboration, it's something similar. And so what are the X factors that are missing for collaboration to be successful and specifically collaborative leadership? Now, just to sort of set the scene for today, um, Greg Meyer, one of our black belts in ID, you can see on the screen here, Greg, welcome, um, offered to do a little exercise with us that maybe just helps set the stage for what we're going to dig into today. So without further ado, Greg, I'll hand over to you. And when we come back, I'll show some slides and walk you through what we're going to cover today and get straight into it. It's a pretty action-packed hour today. Okay, this, may, this may not work for everyone who's driving, uh, because the idea here is for you to be able to write down five words. And uh, we might have to get away with three here, but I'd like to do five. Then those of you at a desk can have a chance to do it, or, or even in your chat, but just don't send them to anyone yet. <laughs> just, just don't send them yet. The idea behind this is... Um, is based on this on a request if someone came to my house and they said, Ooh, I'm hungry. And I said, oh, good, you want some soup? And um, very, very few people would go, yes. What would they ask before they'd say yes? Anyone? What are my I choices? Think, what kind? Yeah, what, what, what soup? Because soup, so I'm using that nickname, a soup word. A soup word is when it means a general something, but everyone's got their own definition. So I just want to play this little activity to show you how many soup words there are out there. And we're going to use the word collaboration. So I'd like you to write down your five words that mean collaboration to you. It's like these five words must be there or there's really no collaboration happening. And summarize them. Try to keep it into one word. I know for some of you that'll be a stretch. Um, so one word, if you have to, a couple that goes, yeah, collaboration, ah, got to have this. So quickly write down the five. And um, the idea is that it really means it to you. So when I say it, you go, ah, oh, yeah, you mean, and get a capture of that. And those of you that, Ellen, don't you dare write this down, so you need to memorize your five. <laughs> and I, I pulled over. I pulled over just for you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I get that a lot on the road. Okay. So. Soup, yes. So I like Clifford's answer. Soup, soup, soup sounds good. Pull me up. <laughs> that was good, son. And there are some people that go, yeah, I don't care. 
Now, I'm, I don't know how long to stretch this, but here's the game wall. Those of you have to write while I'm talking. One, I've got all of you got your five. Here's what we do now. One of you is going to read out your list. And the rest of you, all I need to do is to see if you've got that word. What we're looking for is how many words we all have on our list. Same word. How many of, of all the words we'll have out of the five, will the group say, oh, yeah, uh, we all have that one five word or that two or that three. And before that, I'd like you to have a little vote. You can just use your fingers in the camera or you can put in text. And the vote is, how many words do you think this group of people will share? And that's all I want to know is how many how many words that all of this 29 of us will have on our list? At least one, five, three, four. And you're going to vote with your hand. If you think all five, you do that. If you think none, you do that. And you do it in between. Right. So let's do that first. How many words do you think we will all share? Okay, Julian got me a zero. Just throw them up, guys. Let me see. We got three. We got two. We got two. Three. Zero. Five. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> now, oh, here we go. One, three. Okay. So there's some real... I'm just down to look at to see what the IDs are, the people who did zero. And... Um, I wonder how many of them are authenticates. Let's just, we'll, we'll look later, okay? Okay, here we go. Now, who needs, someone needs to read theirs out. And, and all the rest, you just keep an idea and then we'll, we'll score them. So when, when they read a word, you simply go, put your, put a zero or, you know, put your hand up, no, nah, not me, or, or put your hand up. No, just put your hand up if you got it. That's what we'll do. And I'll have a look at the screen. Ian, can you look too? Because I'm watching faces. All right, who'd like to read their list? You'll have to put your, uh, unmute yourself if you're going to read your lips. What just happened? Evelyn just put yeah. a hand up. Okay, great. Go, Ev. So my numbers, right? No, you read the, the words you wrote down. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then give a little pause so we have time to vote, Evelyn. Yeah, I just joined. So I, I think I missed the first part of your question. Sorry about that. You have five words? Uh, not yet, because I just okay. joined. So sorry. Let, let okay, Hardy, go. All right, my five words. Partnership. One at a time. What's say it again? Partnership. Partnership. Stop. Who's got partnership? Hand up. We got one. Okay, next. Two. Next. Participation. Participation. Both start with part. Now we got another one. Ooh, Lauren, you're online with them. Go, Hardy. Cooperation. Cooperation. Come on, guys. Cooperation. Collaboration. Co we got one, two. Yep. Keep going. Aligned. Aligned. One. Yep. Couple. Oh, one. Okay. On. Hey, nice and aligned. Uh, integrate. Oh, on, yeah. And integrate. Okay. So this is now demonstrated what I've been using this game for over 20 years, and this happens every single time. Never in a group, even the top three people of a very major marketing company who ran the go group as a group, as these three as a triad, they couldn't get five <laughs> between the three of them, right? So never once have I had a whole group all have at least one word on it, even if the word collaboration's in their vision, <laughs> so, and particularly. So... The message I'm trying to I use this as an opening before we start talking, as soon as we say any word that's got anything more than uh, even pencil, your shape's going to be your picture because people are making up what they hear and then they're using that makeup to decide what they're going to do. And so when we go into a workshop, we want to say, you don't know what they just said from their point of view, what they don't know, you don't know what they heard from when you said that word. And collaboration is one of the classic ones because we're talking about collaborating, and yet from the outset, we don't even know what we're agreeing with. Okay? So if we go into this workshop, I'd like you to remember that when you hear someone say something, uh, you don't know enough yet. And that's why we do so much checking in with ID because we know, and it's interesting to watch the actual numbers represent. Last thing is this, um, if we ran out another list, I've had people, we'll read another list, maybe we'll get it. And try to be nice to those people, right? Because <laughs> they're really excited. They don't get the game, right? They're the verifiers, Greg. They're the verifiers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
And I've had one guy say, well, that was a stupid list. Listen to mine. And then you bend the conversation. Go. Anyway, Paul, back over to you. I just want to remind us that we don't really we don't really know what the other person is saying. So let's be gentle. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well done. Thank you for doing that, because we'll we'll draw on that um, exercise a little later as we get into that. Well, probably a, a lot of uh, when we get through uh, this session to, as we go through the session today. So in terms of this topic of collaborative leadership, so what I'm really going to focus on here is not so much collaboration, but collaborative leadership. This is really important. I have a bunch of slides that will be sent to you and to everyone who signed up for the webinar. They will receive the recording of this webinar and these slides. So some of the slides I'm going to race through, um, knowing that we're sending them to you as a resource and you can study them a little later. But, you know, um, the topic here is just super valuable. And then I'll add in to the slides any relevant commentary that comes out of today's webinar. I'll adjust that into the slides before we then send them out. So it'll be a really valuable deck for you to have. Here's what we're going to cover. What is collaborative leadership? And very importantly, what is it not? What are the hallmarks of good collaboration? What are some of the pitfalls? When do you use it? And how does ID relate to collaborative leadership? Like, do you have a natural fit? Is that something you're going to struggle with? What are the things you want to keep in mind as you maybe try and shape teams to be great examples of collaboration? And if you're leading them, that you can be a great collaborative leader. All right. So why is this whole topic of collaboration so important? You know, it's, it's as I said before, it's, it's, in, its prominence has increased over the years. And now it's at a point where it's like one of the hot topics in leadership for 2024. So why is that? And I'm going to just suggest a couple of things to you um, that maybe might land, because it's not just a nice to have. The question for me really was, is it or is it actually imperative? Like, could it be that the companies that are, are struggling to achieve their goals uh, that's occurring because they're missing this X factor on collaboration. Could it be? Could it be that significant? Um, if they don't collaborate, can they still, you know, succeed or even can they survive? How how compelling and imperative it is this issue? And I'm suggesting to you that I think on what I see in all of the work we do, I think it's like the X factor. The companies that get this right are innovative and successful and relevant, and they will survive. And the companies that don't get this right, they aren't going to be around. It's not just that they're going to sub-optimize. They won't be relevant. And relevance, when you sit in board meetings and people are looking at three- and five-year plans, relevance is one of the key things that companies will often have to consider because they know that what they're doing today won't necessarily secure that they will be here in five years' time. And the way they even deal with that topic sometimes is, you know, the, the 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 key to whether they're going to be there. So I would suggest to you the reason it's so important is because as we've become more digitized in this world, we've shifted from companies and functions and silos to the concept of ecosystems. Now we're able to do business remotely, globally, virtually. And we don't even need to have people on our team anymore as paid staff. We outsource it. So much of our technology platform, for example, is a meshing together of a, of a lot of outsourcing of different vendors. And in order for that to work as a seamless proposition to you, the customer, like all of us being here on this call today, we're using Zoom. We could be using WebEx Teams. We could be using uh, Outlook. There's a number of different technologies that we bring together in order just to have the one seamless output at the end. And now that we're working in that more cross-functional, think of it as more of a horizontal way of working, it's not that the old command and control directive style of leadership and functioning doesn't cut it anymore. And the companies that, you know, you think of some of the bigger companies in the world as digital transformations took place they don't exist anymore. Blockbuster being a great example and just one example of that, right? So as, as you look at providing this more 
subscription-based digital offering, which so many companies are, are now either doing or moving towards, you can't do it as one function. You can't just go out there and sell your product and leave and walk away. If it's a subscription-based offering, you've got to make sure that there's value being provided all the way through on a continuous loop, which means to do that, the product people have got to work with the service people, with the support people, with the admin people. Everyone's got to work together as one common team. That's never been so prominent as it is today. And that's why companies are now pushing for it, but they're also really struggling with it because of a number of reasons. One is that to get good collaboration, as you've seen a minute, you've got to have a certain framework in place. But the other is that when we look at it through the lens of ID, so many teams are led by people that are not collaborative. Their very nature is to be a problem-solving you know, if you think most of the teams are verify led, and I say this to you as a fellow verifier, but so many teams that are led or, or that consist of a verify driven culture are so into solving the problem themselves, the concept of solving it together horizontally with everybody, not only is counterintuitive to their makeup, get this, it's a sign of weakness. So many people see it as a sign that if I've got to reach out and can't do it myself, it's not about can't, but they feel like it is, that I'm admitting a sign of weakness or vulnerability. Until it's called out, even realized and addressed, then they're going to revert to type. They're going to revert back to their instincts, which is to solve the problems themselves. Now, that's just, there are a couple of reasons, right? That the ID makeup, the fact they don't have a framework, there's, there's just a couple. Um, you know, framework isn't just about how we have the conversations and collaboration. It's also about do we even have the trust and the awareness of the differences? Like Greg said, how do we how do we even interpret what each each person is saying? And when people haven't done the work to put the framework in place for good collaboration, it's typically not going to get there. Now, the other reason that it is imperative is when you study transformations, organizations that try and transform bit by bit i will start with this function over here and when we get that moving we'll move on to this function you know the next next sort of um, pawn in the puzzle it just doesn't work transformations only work when they're signed up to by the entire organization and they go through it simultaneously that is a law of transformation many leaders don't realize that yet but i use that i'm being really strong in what i'm sharing with you because I too share the frustration, not, not so much of our team, but I share it from what I observe with a lot of our um, clients where they're struggling to get collaboration, but they haven't, they haven't put the things in place to actually get there. And they still are trying to drive a transformation through like the old concept of I'll get the early adopters on board. When you think about change management and change leadership, I'll get the early adopters. So we start with this leader or this function, but then we don't we do it incrementally and it never works like that. And finally, an exasperated CEO comes along and mandates something and says, this is how it needs to be. And with that, it's like you get on the bus or get off the bus. And once it's more directive like that, typically you see something start to happen. Now, I'm not saying that directive leadership is the way to enable collaboration, but it, it's, you know, it, it is what happens out there when there's when collaboration um, fails to get traction. So I do think it's an imperative. I've got a whole slide on why collaboration is important. I'm not going to go through it with you, but it's here in the in, in the deck for you um, to, as a resource later. So let's talk about collaborative leadership. So if collaboration is the working together to achieve a common goal and the operating word there being together, what is collaborative leadership? And it's very easy, I think, to sort of, we could all draw the conclusion, well, leadership means you're the one facilitating the coming together of all of those people to work towards a common goal. So the first part of that second paragraph, to me, is not really a surprise. You know, um, the guiding and facilitating of this joint effort like the conductor of an orchestra, I guess, is the metaphor that I would think of. So the teamwork, the shared problem solving and decision making, that part is, I think, what we all, you know, relate to. 
But really, it's the next part of this paragraph that I think is often glossed over when it comes to collaborative leadership. And that's the whole other side of the of the collaboration coin. It's not just about the the um the planning and strategizing and the problem solving. It's about the execution side. Think of it as a coin. So on one side is all the planning, strategizing, decision making, the problem solving, but then we've got to go and execute. And collaborative leadership has as much, if not more, to do with ensuring the collaboration continues through the execution phase, not just in the planning and decision-making phase. And that that in itself, I think, for many leaders is a light bulb. You know, they don't, if you watch what plays out in reality, they don't put the same emphasis on ensuring the continuation um, of the collaboration through execution. So that's an important thing. If you're going to lead it and be an influence or a champion of this process, I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind straight away. I might just stop there in case anyone has any questions or comments on what I've shared and then we'll move on. All right. So maybe a way to think about it is like this. We think we, we talk about, you know, horizontal leadership. That's another phrase that's coming up a lot. I hear, you know, in a lot of the work that we do. So horizontal leadership is one part of it. You've got to you've got to think not hierarchically, but that we're all on an equal playing field. But but also that there's an up and down. The collaboration isn't just with the people involved right now in the problem solving conversation. It's also with the other members of the ecosystem that are up, down and around that particular group that might be working together. So it's a more expansive mindset that's needed. And then when you get to the collaboration, sorry, to the execution part of that, you know, the ongoing journey requires the the whole 360 view as well. So when someone's leading collaboration, a collaborative effort, there's a lot of people that take it on as a, almost like a side gig, you know, like let's say I'm looking for a stretch assignment. And so I'll take on the, the leadership of that initiative, which involves collaboration. But when you look at what's actually required, it needs a lot more horsepower and governance and focus than what it's typically given in many cases. And hence, one of the reasons it doesn't succeed uh, so often. What is collaboration not? What I'm about to show you here is really important because this is where I would say, you know, where the water naturally flows with collaboration. So in the absence of understanding it and <clears throat> putting the right framework in place, this is what typically plays out when teams embark on a journey of trying to be more collaborative. What happens is they end up with a lot more meetings. They end up with a lot more discussion in conversations, but typically the more confident or um, experienced or senior or dominating personalities, they are the ones that dominate those conversations. So it's not a team of equals. It's really a conversation dominated by dominant people. Or there's the concept of trying to get consensus, you know, because collaboration sort of means we all have a voice that so we all want to hit, know that our voice is not only heard, but recognized and, and, and factored in to the end result. So I think there's a natural sense of consensus or even unanimous agreement that we're trying to achieve in order to demonstrate that it was good collaboration. And that is a furphy. That these are not the hallmarks of good collaboration. In fact, it's where the water naturally flows, but it's also what turns people off staying involved in these collaborative efforts. So as a collaborative leader, you're actually pushing it uphill. If you let the water flow in this direction, you're going to struggle to retain engagement of that team because they're going to say, I can't handle this many meetings. I've got to get back to my real job. I sit in these meetings, but I don't get a chance to talk because it's dominated by other people. Or we talk and talk and talk and talk, but we don't come up with a decision. Or I thought we did, but then we relitigate it the next time we meet because we're always trying to get this common agreement and we just don't make the progress. So then people revert to what they can control and they can control their own domain and we're back to silos once again. So understanding that these things 
naturally play out. And your job as a collaborative leader is to not only ensure they don't happen, but to put the framework in place to, to prevent these things from happening um, is really key. So again, I'll stop there in case anyone has any comments or questions. All right, so I could call these common pitfalls, but I'm gonna to move to the actual pitfall topic. So keep in mind the three things I just shared with you, uh, you know, natural consequences of where unbridled collaboration flows to, and as a leader, you need to combat and prevent those things. But here are the common pitfalls that typically play out with collaboration. As a collaborative leader, you know these are the things to watch out for as signals that it's not working, and ideally, with the right framework, prevent them from happening in the first place. So spinning conversations, because, you know, we want to have collaboration. So I don't want an agenda. I don't want too much preparation. Let's solve it all together. But what happens is it just spins. The over-rotation, think of it like a pendulum. We, we've got collaboration on the one hand and mandates on the other. And we don't want people to feel that they, you know, are all being controlled. So we rotate over here to coll collaboration with everyone having a voice which means everyone shares their opinions, even though it's the same as someone that spoke before them. And, and then we're trying to get consensus. So I think there's, it's actually, you know, like we often talk about, it's everything in moderation, right? So there's still a place for mandates. There's still a place for being directive. And there's a definitely a place for collaboration. But as a collaborative leader, like the conductor of an orchestra, it's like knowing when to balance and which one to call on at different times. We will talk about that a little bit later. A third pitfall is assuming that because we talked about it and we had an open conversation and everyone had their voice, therefore we got it. We're in agreement, we're aligned, and it's going to work. And Greg, that example that you started, that exercise that you started with today is just the perfect example of when we speak and we hear the words so we all know what we mean, we actually don't. And I'm working in a number of teams very closely, like in daily stand-up meetings, where I'm watching the team, and they're all senior executive level people, talk things through, and they get it. And it's not until we get down the track when they're starting to take action on some of those things, and you realize how far apart each person was on what they took away from the meetings. So the assumption that we spoke about it, so we agreed, um, or that, you know, we're all aligned as we continue to go forward. And that is what happens. I still hear leaders say, Paul, I shouldn't have to spoon feed this. I shouldn't need to have to be instructed. We shouldn't have to spend it. I know, I know, I know. But the thing is, we're humans. And the minute you hear yourself say should, that should be a trigger that, you know, something's needed here. It doesn't always play out the way you wished it should. Dominate, dominant people dominate the flow. And so the outcomes are often achieved, which look like a consensus or look like there was a collaboration. You want to be really careful that it's not really what one person, and sometimes it's the leader, has actually orchestrated. The sign of weakness I talked about is a real pitfall. So you've got people in the meetings or in the collaboration effort that may have their own levels of insecurity. So that speaks to the fact that a hallmark of good collaboration means that people need to feel safe to be able to speak their truth and speak, speak from a place of authenticity and vulnerability, not being a weakness, not being an admission of any type of failure, but just of their truth. Um, and, and, you know, being open to the synergy of everyone's contribution. And the last point there, unless uh, unless and until you shift each person to action, you won't really have like, that. that's the litmus test of whether you've really had um, agreement to the point of alignment. So I think of it as, you know, you've got to win their hearts as well as their heads. The, the heart, in this case, being like the emotional connection and the, and the resulting behavior, is only really evident when you see the people taking action. So finishing a collaboration conversation around, so we're all in agreement then, we're all good, we all understand it, okay, let's go and get back to work. That is like not going to work. But having 
some actions that everyone's going to go and do that they feel accountable to. It's only when that their feet are held to the fire like that do you start to get the real questions, the real concerns, the the you know the real obstacles that that they are anticipating, and then you have the real conversation um, as a collaborative effort. So these are some of the common pitfalls. I'm not saying that that's all there are, but having done, I, I would say they map to my own experience as well as the research work I've done preparing for today. These are the very common things that occur. All right, any any questions or comments from people? Paul, you have a question in chat from Andrea. Okay, thank you. Would someone like to read it? Andrea, would you like to read it out? I oh, yeah, sure. Um, I was just curious about what's a good strategy for being directive without dominating the conversation. Um, well, it, it starts by understanding your ID. I think, um, let, let me, can I come to that a little later when we talk about when best to use it? I've got some things. Oh, I'll absolutely. Share. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's talk now. <clears throat> Get my slide working on the hallmarks. Like, how do you know when it's working well? Like, what do you need for it to work well? Right. So these are some of the things. I'm just going to flash the screen up here walk you through, but when I talked before about having a framework, these are the things that I meant when I talked about having a framework. So the first one to think about is who's leading it? How have you appointed the leader of a collaborative effort? Is it, if, particularly if it's like an initiative that you're starting as a cross-functional exercise, did you just ask for a volunteer? Is it a person because it's their remit, so they should lead it? Um, but are they actually suited to collaborative leadership. And I'm suggesting to you that in the same way as when you work with athletes, some athletes are wired to like sprint distances and some are more the marathon mindset and makeup. The same is true with the way we're wired. Some people are really wired to be collaborative leaders and some people are not. And I would suggest to you that people that are strong verify, avoid, improvise, particularly, who are unskilled on the EQ side. So you've got to have both together because you can also have someone who's an avoid, verify, improvise, and if they're unskilled on EQ, that's not going to work either. So there's the natural wiring and the skill set. I've seen some wonderful collaborative leaders who are verify, avoid, improvise, but they get it. They know what their vulnerabilities are. The question that Andrea just asked about what's a good strategy for being directive without dominating. I mean, I know as a fellow eight and verify, it's very natural and easy to be directive because we figured it out. You know, that part's easy. But understanding yourself and your vulnerabilities and then learning and how can you be more collaborative, that's a journey. And then not only learning it, but getting comfortable in your own skin that that's not a sign of weakness or you're not insecure about that. Now, there are also other people that have got the right wiring to be a collaborative leader. You get someone like um, Hardy, your idea is a great idea for collaborative leadership. But if someone like that is insecure or is, you know, very egotistical um, or not there for the right reasons, it's more about trying to get themselves promoted than it is about the, you know, the common goal of the effort, then that's not going to be a very, a, a very effective leader either. So the two have to go together. But I find many collaborative efforts are led by leaders that haven't got the right EQ and the right wiring to actually enable that. And it's 100% predictable right at the get-go. It's not that it falls apart, you know, three quarters of the way down the journey. Like, oh, we'll, like think of it like a soccer team. It's not like they got to three quarters of the game and then they failed to, to sort of land it. It's before they even got on the field, it was predictable that this wasn't going to work because it was led by the wrong type of leader. That's why I put that particular component, like the ingredient for success, put it right at the top. The second point is around having the right foundation of awareness of differences. If collaboration is to harness the synergy of each other's differences, do we know what they are? We might know what our differences are from a skill and expertise point of view, but what about the difference in our mindset, the different perspectives we bring because of the way we're wired? And then once we're aware of that, do we have a respect for those differences? 
or are some people still dominating? And then have we got the trust and the safety for people to speak their voice and then be heard for what that voice is? That takes work. That takes work just like to be an effective soccer team. Before you get on the pitch, you've actually got to do some work building your fitness. You've got to do some work building your skills, do some work building how we're going to play together as a team. Then we get on the field. The same is true about how we're going to collaborate together. There's some foundational work that needs to be done to build that that fabric of the safety, the authenticity that allows an effective collaboration to occur. So then it's about things like make sure we solve the problems in the room. I've had collaborative leaders. Remember one guy say to me, "I um, mean, yeah, we've got this meeting coming up for collaboration. I just want to spend the weekend planning what we're going to do and sort of figuring out the strategy. And I'm like, actually, you know what, Steve, all that should be done in the room. That's what the collaboration is for. So making sure that that's how you do it. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a straw man in order to avoid spinning conversations. It's all very well. It's actually quite appropriate to go into a meeting with the framework, but it's a framework that should have no attachment. It's a framework to provoke the conversation, to provide guidance. It might be 80% right and there's 20% that needs to be corrected or adjusted to you know, sweep in everyone's views and contribution. It might be that it's 100% wrong, but it provoked the conversation and then away you go. I would suggest that most conversations, work, collaborative conversations, work best when there's a framework that people have put together, like a subcommittee almost, have put something together to come back and test or to work through with the team. That's better than just a total white sheet of paper. It tends to be a spinning conversation where there's no framework. Um, the fifth area is this protocol of disagreeing commit, not consensus. So it's it's going to happen that on a team, even when there's been really good collaboration, it doesn't mean that everyone gets their way. The team, like I'll use the soccer example, we might collaborate on when we're going to train together as a team and everyone puts their you know, opinions on the table. And mine might be that I don't want to train on a Wednesday night. But guess what? The team decided that Wednesday night it is. So either you're on the team or off the team, but if I'm going to be on that team, it's now Wednesday night. And it's got to be that I disagree to it, but I commit to it. So I don't now turn around and, say, and keep bitching about the fact that it's a Wednesday night or that, you know, it's what they decided to do. No, if I'm on the team and the team agreed, then now I buy into that. And if it's something that I just cannot do on a Wednesday night, then don't stay on the team. But this concept of disagree and commit is a really healthy protocol that the team needs to understand and embrace and then see good examples of so that it's not that they then stay on the topic until they reach consensus um, or some form of unanimous agreement. You know, that's that's a really important protocol for healthy collaboration. And as the collaboration leader, these are the things you want to be either installing or ensuring that the, 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 the team stays true to. Now, if you're going to have all these differences, the next point says, if, if we're going to have all these differences on the team, then we want to make sure that something ties those differences together. Otherwise, we're just going to get sidetracked debating opinions. But what you'll find is, you think about it, whenever there's conflict resolution, what do people tell you to do? Find the common ground. And the common ground is the higher purpose. What are we all here for? You know, there is some higher. And if you go to like 10,000 feet and we're still apart, then go to 20,000 feet. But at some level, there will be a common purpose that you find attached to that. And the role of the collaborative leader is to make sure that that compelling vision or strategic purpose is kept front of mind while you're going through the conversation so that the differences don't then cause friction. They're differences that are driving a synergy towards that common outcome. All right, the next one is around momentum and regularity. You can't, you, you won't succeed with collaboration if you only collaborate once a quarter. You know, um, you've got to have a, a real regularity and how you solve the problem. So if you solve problems together 
putting the strategic plan together um, each quarter, but then through the months, you're back to solving things on your own. Guess what's going to happen? You won't have a collaboration culture. So one of the one of the protocols that I'm seeing work really effectively, and it sounds insane to some people, is the concept of a daily stand-up. It's a mechanism of the agile methodology that some of you might be aware of in business. But it's actually really powerful because it pulls the team back together, albeit quickly, but it's very productive to meet regularly, like daily. And I'm watching teams that aim for daily, ultimately probably averaging three days a week. But the point is they're getting three days a week. They're thinking about together. They do, you know, the, the concept of, well, let's raise that in that meeting. And they don't need to have a separate meeting because, you know, today's Wednesday. We're, we're going to be back together on Friday. Let's cover it then. So when you've got a, a framework to be together regularly, it, it enables you to, 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 to trust that we're going to be able to keep solving these problems together. But if we're not coming back together for another quarter or even another month, I mean, then I have to get this thing solved in the meantime. So part of having the right framework for effective collaboration is making sure that we meet regularly. Now, you can get a team to, to agree to meet, but staying on that rhythm is going to be a task. And so your job as the collaboration leader is to keep reminding people of not just the higher strategic purpose, but even the purpose of why we're going to do the daily stand-ups. And, and that's, you know, reminding of the why, the Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek you know, um, principle of it's all about the why, not the what and the how, but keep reminding the why. That's what's at the center of the circle. Um, that's really key in your role here just to keep the rhythm for these meetings. And lastly, reminding everyone of the concept of horizontal leadership, that we're all on this together. We all have a voice. And no matter seniority or experience, everyone has a perspective that matters on the team. So not only do they need to hear everyone, but quite frankly, I, I, I think the challenge here is not around people getting heard. It's around people speaking up and having the confidence to actually share their truth. And before they'll share their truth, they need that second point here in option B, the safety to be able to speak vulnerably and authentically. So these are the hallmarks to me. If you're going to take on, if you, you are aspiring or driving towards collaboration, and as I said before, it's an imperative. So the leader of the future, when you think about the future of work and the future of leadership, this skill set of being an effective collaborative leader is absolutely critical. If we could go to the MBA classes of 2024 and say, what's the number one thing you need to be teaching and equipping your people with? To me, this is it. And you can see there's a whole ton of stuff in here. Self-awareness. You know how to build teams. It's all here, but it's all driving towards ultimately collaboration. And not only is collaboration the, the X factor for transformation, which is what companies are struggling with, it's actually the X factor for innovation. In order to have innov like constant innovation, you need collaboration. And so these, these ingredients here, these this is what every leader should be driving at, not just the people that are leading a collaborative effort that when we, we give something a cute code name and say this is you know project x that we're going to drive through in 2024 every team even functional teams these days are part of an ecosystem and need to be thinking this way and having these types of protocols and frameworks to um you know do their work so i'll stop there in case people have got questions or comments before moving on Paul, Paul, this is Hardy. I'd like to throw out just uh, a comment on the daily standups and the importance of those and taking that horizontal mindset. I've used daily standups the last couple of companies I've worked for, and they're invaluable. And these daily standups, they're like 10 minutes, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. But it's very important because there's a, a psychological threshold that exist, you know, threshold of importance is, if we didn't have this, is it important enough to call a meeting? Is it important enough to pick up the phone and call Paul? 
no, it's not that important. I just really wanted to, you know, share an idea, you know, and that's what makes it so powerful. Um, you know, if you believe like I do that everybody has something to teach me, you know, this is invaluable because great ideas come out of these daily stand-ups. Thank you, Artie. That's excellent. Yes, and I will say that I know that daily stand-ups are meant to be really brief calls. The leadership teams that I'm working with, they're going through so much at the moment. The daily stand-ups are like an hour each, you know, but they're moving mountains. Like it really is valuable. They're not spinning conversations. It's really been quite phenomenal to watch what they're achieving, but they decided to commit the time to it. And it's really, and you know what? They're bitching, like they, they it's taken a lot of time and they've, there's a still a, a tension, but it's like the healthy tension. Like like I saw Greg in the chat say, one a great hallmark of being on a team is you don't always get your way, you know? And the same is true with when you're in a team, just because it's working doesn't mean you love every minute of it, you know? <laughs> it, like there's so many things we do in life, the outcome is worth it. It doesn't mean the process was fun. There's plenty of medicine we take that doesn't taste good, but it, it gets what we, you know, takes the pain away, right? So um, I, I just think it's a a really important thing to to think about doing as a team because most teams are, are still are back in the, you know, to me, the, the old way of quarterly meetings and the rest of the time we work on our own. Well, you think about that even in a family. If you only came together as a family once a quarter and the rest of the time everyone worked, lived in their own bedrooms, you probably wouldn't have much of a family dynamic. You know, it's the coming together on a regular basis and sharing around the dinner table on the, and it's not everyone shares every night, but if we do it every day, by the end of the week, we're probably all connected with each other. And, you know, that that's what the daily stand-ups do or the concept of them. Hey, uh, Paul, I just had one um, more reinforcing point um, that, uh, on F here, the the clear strategic purpose, it um, the the um, reinforcement of that and the um, repetition of that in maybe different contexts. Um, you know, when something might be feeling left of field or or not connected, um, being able to show that um, and 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 repeating that to to make sure that it's understood. Um, maybe from different from different angles to uh for a team i think is um really important uh because it's not you, you might have a strategy strategy and 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 like you were saying before everyone's nodding and yep we get it and what have you but um it's in the doing of and making sure that you don't get lost in the weeds that really brings brings that back together for people and helps them feel connected to um the delivery of that strategy i think f there is really um, really pertinent from my perspective. Yeah, thank, thanks, Tristan. Yes, in fact, I still hear, if you if you play this out, you hear so many people say, listen, I'm really busy. Can you just tell me what you want me to do? And the, and the default is always to the task. You know, what do you want me to do? And in the doing, they they lose the purpose. You know, like if, they, if all they're doing is hearing about the task and they only want to know what do you want me to do, that's, that's a signal that they're driving back to the silo mentality. They need to live and breathe that strategic purpose and motivation um, and care about understanding that and keeping that alive. So thank you, Tristan. Jill, I can see you've got your hand up. You're also on mute. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I'm glad he brought up F. It's the same. I have found going over the strategic purpose and vision at the outset of a project to be very helpful in in connecting the team and then it's a re point of reference to go back to but involving everybody at the very beginning in why we are doing what we're doing together thank you well and i will say in if i think about my role when i'm like playing the role of either you know a team coach or um, an executive advisor to the team I, I often find that the leader is so engrossed in the work and the conversation one of the most important roles I play as the facilitator and the external person is I'm the one that keeps bringing them back to guys. But remember, we said this three months ago, guys, remember what the purpose is here. Remember our vision. Remember the key values. And so like pulling their heads from down to up and looking up at that bigger strategic purpose, that's often one of the 
the real either someone needs to have that assigned to them and i know you'd think it would be the leader but even a leader could do with having the, the backup of someone like an external advisor to and i'm not saying that to plug consultants it could be someone from within the same company but if that is you it's you know it's really important to make sure that you're a, a strong voice to keep that because to your point jill it's crucial at the start but it's equally important all the way through because people default to task. doesn't matter what their idea is. They default to task, not strategy and vision. All right. So um, when is it best used? I know we're quickly running out of time here. So let me just quickly talk about when do you use collaboration and when is it best to be directive? And then I'll come to your, your point too, Andrea. So I would say what, what I've seen play out is when you're trying to solve problems together and make important team decisions, that's when collaboration really works. But if it's about informed meetings, so you'll come back from something, you know, and, and, and you've traveled and you're coming back to inform people, that's inform. That doesn't, that's not the same thing. That can still have questions. You can still have a Q&A session. You can do an all hands meeting with a Q&A session, but those sorts of informed meetings, that's not the time you're really trying to have the same style of collaboration. Q&A and conversation is not the same, right? So I think it's important to distinguish because some people might be in a meeting thinking they're informing, but others are there thinking, but are we trying to make a decision? And if we're trying to make a decision, then they'll they'll be trying to be in collaboration mode when the person that might have you know instigated the meeting was doing it more to just inform. So that's just a simple distinction. Um, there might be other nuances that we can factor in, but there, I think just to even think about, it doesn't mean you've got to collaborate all the time. There are specific times when it shines and there's other times where you just need to share the communication. So to Andrew's question, how do you, what's a good strategy for being directive without being dominating? This is a great question as a, as a segue into ID and collaboration. So first of all, the people that what might sound um, being directive is there are times for it and that's really valuable. But being directive in a way that works for the team is something I think on them on them for the most part, verifiers are the ones that need to watch out for this because verifiers have a way of sharing what it sounds like they're right and that they've thought it all through, and that this is the way to go. And when we talk like that, it shuts people down. So I found for myself, I'm just I'm just saying this for, my, for what I find helpful for me, are two things. Number one, check your heart. Check where your heart is. When we talked before about a horizontal mindset, check where is your heart. Are you really in a place of, you know, openness and team? And, and focused on the on the mission, or are you actually in a place of frustration um, with the person, with the team, with the issue, and your and or wedded to that outcome. So just doing a self check on where are you at, and making sure that you're really in a place of openness is really key to a verifier because our default is to get to the the you know what's the answer. And staying open to the possibilities of more options, that's something we need to step back and check ourselves on. And that's part of good EQ. My measure for myself is whether the outcome we're achieving is different to what I was expecting. And I love that because that holds me, for, for me, I love it for me, because it holds me accountable to being open. So I often go into meetings having thought through what I think is sensible. But I love it when I'm like, okay, you know what? I think that's better. And I have found, Andrea, and as a fellow verifier, when you're then supporting an outcome that wasn't yours in the first place, you don't come across in, in a negative directive way. It's just more of a reinforcement. But if you're you're more vulnerable to the directive style being off putting to people if you're actually pressing for just your way and it hasn't really yet you know uh, uh, allowed the broader conversation but if there has been that broader conversation 
and you yourself have pivoted to an outcome that represents the team, but not necessarily consensus, like everyone. Um, and and then you say, okay, guys, let's let's lock in on that's what we need to do. And I'm being clear that's that's the direction we're taking. That will land better because I think people can see that you're being really open to, you know, um, to, to the input of the team. All right. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I did have a slide here on ID just to show the different IDs, but I talked to it instead. So I said before, the natural collaborative leader, let me quickly show it to you. If you look from right to left, if you get people that are really strong, like on the on verify, authenticate, complete, avoid improvise, these people, their their superpower is getting the work done, like as a as a one person team. So you know, the, and can they be a great collaborative leader? Yes, and I can think of examples right now of people I know who are awesome at it, because this is an ID that one on the left, and, and you know the first several are ones that they love mastering something. And if they decide to master leadership and collaborative leadership, they that's their EQ and they get really good at it. And they're probably even better because they make sure there's that framework that's in place that we had on some earlier slides. The people that have a natural wiring for collaborative leadership, but still need the EQ and still need the framework are people over here on the, on the right. And so one of the things I would want to leave you with as a message from today, just think about who have you got leading your collaborative efforts? Because they won't all be people, potentially, won't all be people that are just naturally set up for success. And then secondly, have they done the work as a team to get those ingredients in place to ensure their success? Help them do that, and I'm sure you'll see a lot more success. So... Um, to finish off today, this is our last webinar for the year. So on behalf of all of the team here at Instinctive Drives, um, thank you for all of your support through the year. I'd like to wish all of you a really Merry Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful break. Enjoy the time with your families. Stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you reinvigorated when we start up again in 2024. Take care, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.